Hiya. Everyone, it's Steve. How are you doing? It is ooh, May 23rd, 2021. And you know what that means? A new day, a new story. And this one is going to be a little bit different from the normal run because I'm going to bring you a video that I did, I think a little over a year ago that really didn't get a whole lot of viewing and I feel like it's just this really bizarre entertaining story and it's directly related to the little piece that I found for today's story. It's related to one of the primary figures involved in that and it just goes to show what a douchebag he was. Anyway, as I said, May 23rd, shut up bus, May 23rd, 2021. New video. But before we get there, remember to always like, share, subscribe, hit up my Patreon. I'm always posting new stuff for there. Even if you give me a dollar, uh, you know, enough people give me one dollar and I am really feeling good about doing a lot more stuff uh, on this channel. So thank you in advance. If you're going to help me out that way, the link to my Patreon is in the description below, as well as links to my Instagram and Facebook pages, closely related to the content that I am posting here on this channel, Steve the Amateur Story. And, and without further ado, let's get to today's story. And it's going to take us way back. This mask has been sitting on our microwave and I made gumbo last night. The moment I slipped this mask on briefly to get through the intersection there, my first thought was, this mask smells like gumbo. Anyway, story of my life, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to talk about one of the real kind of unknown scumbags of early Portland history. Unknown because he wasn't really, a, he wasn't a super influential figure. He wasn't a governor, he wasn't a senator, he wasn't a banker. He wasn't filthy rich. They weren't naming buildings after him. But it was this guy named Walter Moffat. And Walter Moffat was just a crap human being. He ran a saloon. Now, mind you, again, we're going back to 1874. Like I said, early Portland history. As of this time, the city of Portland was only like 23-ish years old. Or was it a... St I always mix it up. I always forget. Was Portland established in 1850? I always think 1851. Or was it 1854 or 1859? For some reason, all three of those, uh, I'm just in my mind. Anyway, Portland was a very young city. And Walter Moffat was a guy that he owned the Webfoot Saloon in, in town. And the springtime of 1874 was not particularly kind to Mr. Moffat, not that he deserved to, I mean, the main reason that time period wasn't so nice to him was because he was such a piece of crap, which we'll get to. But again, by May, he'd already had a really bad couple of weeks beforehand. And on this particular day, back in 1874, Walter Moffat is arrested for assault and battery. Again, this is after he's already had pretty lousy couple of weeks and he's busted for assault and battery um, in relation to a man named Henry Stitzel and even though the description of the events was very brief the implications are very clear what was what's up bicyclist the uh, Mr. Moffat had obviously been engaging in an adulterous affair with Stitzel's wife. And Stitzel was obviously not too happy about it. There's squirrels. You hear that? Squirrels going wild. So obviously uh, Stitzel confronted Moffat about it. A fight ensued and it appears Moffat probably either won, uh, won the fight or Stitzel felt that because he was the guy whose wife was cheating on him with this other man that, you know, he was the obvious victim in the scenario. So he pressed charges of assault and battery against 
Walter Moffat. And I think over the course of the remainder of the 70s, Mr. Moffat kind of faded a little bit into obscurity. And I want to say he was even, by like 1880 or 1881, I think he was dead. I want to say he died not too long after all this, and he wasn't particularly old when he died. But what Mr. Moffat was probably best known for, aside from his saloon, aside from things such as this, like sleeping around with other men's wives, he was most known for uh, events that had transpired a little while before this adulterous affair. Again, he was already not doing so great. Maybe he was feeling overwhelmed by embarrassment and he felt justified then in uh, falling into the loving arms of another man's wife. Maybe that's what drove, maybe these events were what drove him to it. But then again, Walter Moffat seems like he was, again, pretty much a total douchebag. And so the reason he did this may have just been <laughs> douchebaggery reasons. Douchebaggery, that should be in the dictionary. But anyway, I want to bring to you now a video that I did about a year ago. And it delved into... A, a very short period, a period of a couple of days that again preceded these particular events by only a short period of time. And it was kind of how Walter Moffat, uh, his name and his saloon, tavern, whatever you want to call that, kind of came to a little bit more prominence. And it was a, uh, a really funny story. I don't want to spoil any of it for you. So now I bring to you the video that I did about Walter Moffat and his saloon that would uh, become infamous in relation to the events that occurred there. Here we go. You had a lot of, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. You have a lot of instances where you have a, a collision between a faction of women and a faction of men. And they're, they're bumping heads for whatever reason. And, you know, there's kind of a prevailing attitude that uh, men think logically and women think emotionally. So you think when they start butting heads, the women, the men will just be like, oh, oh, oh. the women will just be like, ah! um, with that form of logic. However, that being said, we uh, in our society have seen numerous examples where... Um, Rather, the opposite seems to be the case. I found this story originally on the Offbeat Portland History website. I think it's offbeat, offbeatportland.com or offbeatportlandhistory.com. And they did, um, a while back, um, a couple pieces on there in relation to uh, the women's temperance movement as it was happening in Portland. Um, you know, and a big prominent part of that was you had a lot of women in the city that wanted um, saloons and any places that were selling, you know, booze. They wanted these places closed down. Um, you know, most men back in the day would drink. I mean, women did too, but it was, you know, much more often men. They would just, you know... They would just drink so heavily. They would get drunk all the time. It's probably why a lot of them were kind of transients, and a lot of them would go home and beat their wives. Um, in my Historic Murders of Portland series, I've done how many stories, either on men who were just drunken and belligerent and who ended up killing their wives, or wives who uh, got sick of you know, being threatened and ended up killing their husbands out of, you know, defense. He tried to attack me again and I had to kill him. Um, and that was a big, you know, push behind, like, you know, trying to push for prohibition. Um, obviously a lot of things all together come into play, but that was one element was women wanted men to stop getting out and getting drunk and violent all the time. So there was a particular group of women in Portland, um, around the start of, start of the spring, or you know, end of the winter, start of spring, 1874. 
they started showing up outside of the Webfoot Saloon, which was located, I believe it was on First and Morrison, the northwest corner of First and Morrison, which now has an off ramp from the Morrison Bridge. So there's there's nothing left from any era predating, you know, when that bridge went in. But the Webfoot Saloon was located right there. And the proprietor of it was a one Walter Moffat, who was known around the Portland area for being, he was well respected. He was a stand-up guy. He had a good reputation and he was just another saloon owner. You know, saloons were like Starbucks as are today. So he was just another guy running a saloon and this uh, group of temperance uh, women, this temperance organization would uh, kind of show up at his place and you know, uh, pretty early on when they showed up, he ran them off and he screamed at him and he was like, get out of here, you filthy whores. I don't run, I run a saloon, not a whorehouse. So Moffat was, it seemed a little bit more aggressive in his response to these women kind of showing up outside of his place, knowing full well why they were there. Um, but the women kept showing up and he kept running them off. So then March 31st, 1874 comes. The women show up again outside of Moffat's place, and he runs them out again. But instead of just leaving, the women gather right in front of his doorway, essentially blocking entry into the place. And they, they gather in sort of a, a choral arrangement, and they start, you know, singing and praying. And they were these, uh, whether they were fully like this or not, they were presenting them as, as these very uh, calm, gathered, mature, pious, religious women, and they would start singing and praying in front of the place. Um, so they were, they were kind of upping the stakes a little bit. So, <laughs> Moffat is pissed at this point because these women are becoming, in his eyes, more and more of a nuisance. So, fully prepared for them to return the next day, April 1st, April Fool's Day, he procured a bunch of gongs. How he procured them, I don't know. Um, but he procured some gongs, and he waited for these women to return. And once they returned, they leapt out the front entry of the building and started banging these gongs and making a really loud, crazy, uh, you know, disturbance out on the street. And Moffat had strung these little fireworks together and lit the fuse and started throwing them on the sidewalk at these women's feet. Like... They took a situation and made this, like, massive prank out of it. It was some 1870s pranking that actually could have endangered the lives of these women. I mean, you've heard those horror stories about women whose clothing was incredibly flammable, and if, like, a little bit of fire hit it, they would just go up like a match, and here this guy's throwing firecrackers at these women's, uh, at the feet of these women. It creates a big disturbance, and some officers in the area rush the scene, and and separate everyone, and they managed to convince the temperance women to leave and go home. Now that seems to be kind of the end of things. A succession of days go by, the women don't return, things go back to normal at the web foot. And then suddenly, it gets to be April 7th, it's been about a week, and the women show up again, and they start doing the same thing over again. They stand outside of the web foot, and they start singing and praying, and uh, to a degree affecting Moffat's business. So Moffat reacts this time by pulling out a whistle, and and whistling for, uh, whistling for the police. Apparently, it was a specific type of whistle that when you blew it, the police knew it was for them. And who shows up but the chief of police, a very shady, sketchy character known for all sorts of suspicious uh, vice, if you want to call it that. It was a guy named James LaPayas who happened to be the, uh, the chief of police while also being a very sketchy character. But in addition to that, at this time, 1874, he was also a fellow saloon owner. So him and uh, <laughs> Walter Moffat were actually... Um, kind of bros, so to speak. So he shows up. He wants, um, Lapeus shows up. Moffat tells him he wants these women arrested. He wants these women arrested 
for disturbing the peace when really all they're doing is standing outside in front of his place and um, you know praying and singing um, if anything you should have made a complaint that they were affecting his business or something but Lapeus and Moffat are fellow saloon owners and he is gonna do his boy a, a service and so he actually does he arrests these women and he, you know, leads them through town to the police station. And all, all, all along the way, they continue singing and praying. And they're acting like nothing's happening. So they get them to the police station, charge them, put them in a cell. But as they were walking from the Webfoot to the um, police station, they kind of started gathering this following of people that were on the temperance women's side either because they supported their cause or because they were like why are you arresting the, these women for something like this when a week earlier these guys were out in front banging gongs and throwing fireworks at women and you did nothing about that um so they follow them to the police station and as the women are there at the police station this crowd starts to kind of gather and it starts to grow and it starts to get a little bit more hostile and the police realize <sighs> we we got to get the, we got to get these women out of here and back on the street real quick before this thing you know escalates to a point that we don't want it to escalate to let's just put it that way so they rush the women to a judge the judge quickly dismisses the charges says that what they were doing does not constitute disturbing the peace which kind of means they can go back and do it again now because a judge has actively said that they did no wrong and they push the women out of the out back onto the streets calm the people down that are waiting there and try to prevent any further um, incident from happening from that point on. <laughs> and once again, a succession of days goes by. Everything seems to be going back to normal. The Temperance women haven't shown up. The Webfoot's getting back to business. It's another week that passes. It's April 14th now. The women return to the site and they have, uh, you know, another singing prayer session out in front of the Webfoot. And uh, Moffat actually doesn't do anything. He lets it happen, and the women are there for about 30 seconds, and then they, or 30 seconds, 30 minutes, and then they depart. Um, without, seemingly without issue. However, as we learned from April Fool's Day, uh, Walter Moffat was not one to just kind of let things go, let things pass. So it's two days after this, it's April 16th now. Walter Moffat has procured bigger gongs, and he's actually hired, he probably wasn't paying them, but he brought on some local boys in town. He's probably telling them, you know, these women are trying to emasculate us, and it's us against them, and you young boys need to learn how to whatever the hell. So he procures these boys to come bang these gongs. And he somehow gets his hands on a, on a um, like a pipe organ. Was it a pipe organ? I just want to make sure that's accurate. All right, he, he got his hands on an organ, an organ of sorts that he brought there. So he's upping the stakes. <laughs> and there's, you know, when you run a saloon, you're going to have a succession of just local drunks that just kind of wander in and out over and over again. They're, they're just dead broken alcoholics he gets one of these guys a guy who's known as just kind of another local drunk he sets him up at this organ and gives him instructions you know when these women show up start playing the organ and this guy is just drunk out of his mind and it gets to be about two in the afternoon and the women show up and boom the boys are out there and they're banging their gongs big disturbance is happening this is disturbing the peace if anything <laughs> and this drunk in the saloon from the saloon starts bang I'm just I'm, I'm just seeing him just going like da, 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 da. the guy's probably never played a piano or an organ in his life and he's drunk off his ass and he's playing it and so there's just this just explosion of of noise in the air and a massive crowd is gathering because they already know there's been issues here um, over the past couple of weeks and so a crowd comes and gathers and nobody's doing anything to mess with it they're all just watching you know this is this is this is entertainment to them there's no television there's no radio yet people got to get their entertainment wherever they can get it so this is like watching a play unfold and despite 
this chaotic noise, the women stand there and they take it and they stand there and they do their prayers and they sing and they do what they need to do and they're going to handle it. And about an hour goes by or so and the boys are getting kind of tired. They've been banging gongs for an hour. They're, they're, they're tired. The drunk is kind of starting to get tired and things are kind of starting to wear down. So one of Moffat's, uh, Moffat's bartender, a guy named J.F. Good, who was not very good. <laughs> God, that was a terrible joke. Um, and it seemed like these guys were just buddies, because it seemed like this guy was going to do anything for his, for his boss, Moffat. He sees that things are kind of dying down, and he grabs a hose and runs out to a hydrant out, you know, near the saloon. And, you know, fire hydrants are a lot easier to crack these days, but back in the 1870s, probably anybody could access them and get them to work. So he hooks a hose on there and turns it on, and he starts spraying the women down with a freak, this freaking hose. So there's the gongs and the drunken organist, and the women are just getting sprayed down on the street. It is absolute, total, uncontrollable, manic chaos at this point. And they're just doing everything they can to not just run off these women, to, to run these women off, but to like try to just shame them, make them leave with their head between their legs. And the women literally take the water to the face and just deal. And the time continues to go by. The boys finally give up, drop the gongs and leave. It ain't worth it. And... <laughs> So, J.F. Good and probably Moffat and the drunken organist and whoever they can get go and pick up the gongs and start banging them. They're trying to keep the... We're talking like two hours, three hours go by. And the women are just standing there continuing to sing and pray. And they are drunkenly... just Because J.F. Good, while he's been doing this, he's been going in and getting drinks. So... These guys are all just drunk as hell at this point. And at one point, um, you know, J.F. Good walks right up to one of the women and is just banging the gong, like, right in front of her face. And she's just singing like he's not even there. And then when he least expects it, she turns and rips the gong right out of her hand. <laughs> and Moffat sees this, walks up to the woman, because she ain't given the gong back, he pulls a pistol out and threatens to shoot her if she doesn't give the gong back. And she's literally like, yeah, you're, you're going to shoot me? Yeah, right. Totally just called him on it, and he was just like, yeah, and put his gun away. <laughs> They're making just total idiot assholes out of these guys. And it gets to be about 5 p.m. The shenanigans has been going on for three hours now. And J.F. Good is now beyond plastered drunk. And he just, there's like nothing more to do. He just stumbles out front and just starts cursing and swearing and just berating these women any way his broken mind can conceive of. And mind you, nobody has done anything to break to break this fracas up. And uh, <laughs> everyone has just sat there and watched. But for some reason, watching this drunken asshole stand here and just start berating these women who have just taken it all and are just still standing there. There's a guy in the, in the crowd named William Grooms who just happened to be a former city police marshal. So... You know, not only does this guy have police experience, but he probably figures he can get away with stuff that other people can't because he's an old cop. He sees what Good is doing, walks right up to him, and just clocks him right in the face. He just goes down flat, knocked cold. He is out. So you think, good, good job on the part of uh, Grooms. And it was like, when he did that, finally the switch and all these, these people that are standing there and a bit of observing this, finally the switch clicked in their head to where they realized, like, oh my god, we've been standing here watching these guys just berate and insult and disrespect these fine young women. And all of a sudden, a crowd starts rushing towards the webfoot. And uh, Moffat and whoever whoever is involved, they have to back behind the counter. He pulls his pistol out. A bunch of people that are on the street have, have pistols on them. They run into the bar. People are pulling their 
freaking guns out. It's like there's a there's an old fashioned old school saloon shootout about to happen. But right as this starts, the police rush the webfoot, manage to break things down, and somehow no shots are fired, nobody gets killed in this freaking mania. And the police were probably watching closely because the moment that stuff started, the moment that this turned into like a riot of sorts, that was when the police were on top of it. But again, it just shows how the police were, that they were just letting this happen. And it took an ex-officer who was then a, pretty much just a regular citizen at that time to incite backlash against these guys. April 16th, 1874, that's what happened down on 1st and Morrison just... A classic example of what happens when you get, you get men and women butting heads and one side is gathered and the other side just can't deal. And it was, it was just insane. So, but the police break up this seeming shootout that's about to happen but once they break it up and they get the people out of the web foot they just leave like Moffat and his boys are still there the women are still there Moffat and a probably really dazed good between getting punched in the face and getting drunk they have one good gong left they gather up some tin cans and they continue to just try to make as much noise as they can with these for about another hour, it gets to be 6 p.m., and finally the women are like, all right, we've, we've done what we came here to do, and they leave. And only then did the insanity of this whole thing end. But then, it's only, what, 16 hours later, it's April 17th now, the women return to the Webfoot, and Moffat is done. So he literally walks out and goes down to get Police Chief LaPeus himself, who again is a fellow saloon owner, and he's probably just sick and tired of dealing with this whole issue. He's the police chief. He's been having to hear about this for probably a couple weeks because it's a reoccurring thing. But you don't leave a fellow saloon owner hanging, and so he goes with Moffat back to his place, and he arrests the women again um, and this time they are actually charged and convicted they either have to spend one night in jail or pay a five dollar fine and the women agree again they're completely holding their cool and they agree fine we'll do our time we're prepared to spend a night in jail but the problem is people are even more pissed now they're pissed after what they witnessed the day before um, you know, Moffat and the behavior of his these cronies. So uh, the whole town is beginning to turn on him. So an even angrier crowd shows up. And there's this story of Lapeus having to go to the women's cell in, you know, early morning hours. They haven't even served their whole night saying, you need to get out of here. Like they literally were going to kick them out because the crowds were gathering again. And the police were dealing with the same thing they were dealing with before. And the women are like, no, we're prepared to stay here for the night. And he's just like, are you not understanding me? Get out. Like he literally screamed these women out of jail to prevent, again, some kind of uprising outside of the jail. And the women departed. And it was just a massive turning point. It was very helpful to the temperance movement when you saw how these people were, these men were behaving. And it just, it kind of ruined Walter Moffat's business. He uh, hung on for a little while longer and then sold it and got out of the saloon business because he was, his good reputation was gone at this point. And he actually died not too long afterward. And it's thought, which this may explain why a guy with such a good reputation was so contra, or not controversial. I mean, he was controversial, but so confrontational with these women right out of the gate when even other less reputable saloon owners weren't. Um, he was so, you know, disrespectful towards the women that it was one of the things that drove them to coming back there so regularly is they think he actually had late stage syphilis near the end of his life. And they think that might have been part of what was like he was literally just losing his mind and that might have been driving 
his chaotic actions during April of 1874. Um, so that might be an explanation, and you know, the fact that he died shortly after, because syphilis, you know, eventually, you know, eventually you're going to succumb to it. So that that is a theory that people, that, that has been contemplated in terms of why this guy acted erratically, but oh my god. <laughs> Will you talk about, I mean, can, can you imagine some, I mean, even with like, you know, some of the crazy protests we've had in the city of Portland, like they get a little erratic sometimes, you know, the police have to arrest a few people, but think about it, 1874, there's substantially less people in Portland and something this just chaotically insane happens, um, you know, that's what happens when you have a bunch of emotional men who want to escalate things. It's probably one of my favorite old time Portland stories is just so wild and chaotic. It sounds like something out of a freaking Marx Brothers movie or something. But it's real and it really happened and it involved our friend Walter Moffat. So I'm not going to pass up another chance to reuse that video and retell that story again. So I hope you enjoyed and uh, of course as always if you want to help my channel uh, grow, whether you've been here a while or you're new, remember to like the videos, uh, share, subscribe, obviously if you like what I'm doing. If you want to hit up my Patreon, that'd be super helpful to me, even if it's only a buck. Like, seriously, it makes a difference. You don't think it would, but it does. And I'm always posting new stuff there for you as well to say thank you. Give you a little something in exchange for helping me out. The link to that is in the description with this video as well as the links to my Instagram and Facebook pages closely related to the content I'm posting here on this channel. All that said, this has been Steve. And I'll see you next time. Wait, that's not right. I'll see you tomorrow.